Good evening, and welcome to Leesville First Baptist Church. We're continuing in our Bible study in the book of Hosea. We're up to chapter 9. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your holy word. And we know that it's not just for our edification, it's not just for our spiritual growth, but your word is also intended as a love letter to help us to walk closer to you, to know you and to love you. Help us do that tonight. Help us to be faithful to your word, for we confess that many times we twist your scripture, that there are many of us who act as lawyers, twisting the truth to make your word agree with us instead of twisting our lives so that they might be straight with your word. Help us, Lord. We seek revival, but we understand that that comes with repentance. Lead us into repentance. Tonight, as we draw close to your word, let us draw close to your heart that we might learn your way and your will that we might be pleasing children in your sight. We beg this and the gift of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, God talked about the breaking of the covenant. This is a divorce of divorce proceeding. And God has exp explained last week how the people had so rebelled against him, committed spiritual adultery with other gods, that they were no longer his wife. This is a horrible story. You can't lose your salvation. I, I, I've repeated that because you, I can't repeat it enough. But churches can lose their saved people. Christian families can lose their saved members. Until after a while, it's a church in name only. It's a Christian family in name only. Tonight, God's talking about the results of that, that divorce. He is saying, you are no longer mine. You're no longer my spouse. You're no longer my people. You belong with the heathen, with the pagans, with the lost. He, so he says, do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples. Now, th most scholars agree that this was during the time of the fall festival, the harvest as they celebrated all the food they'd gathered over the, the spring and summer's work. Enough food to where they could survive all through the winter and also have enough for a party. And so this is a time of a party for Israel with a lot of rejoicing, a lot of singing, a lot of dancing. But God says, don't. Now that would have made Hosea a, 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 a bit of a laughing stock. They would have said, why shouldn't we celebrate with all this wonderful food? Because you have played the harlot against your God. This food is not the proof of God's love towards you because you broke your love relationship with God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. Now this is unfortunately becoming more and more understandable in modern day America. When I first started preaching and I explained fertility religions in Bible studies, people would look at me as though I were speaking Greek. And we will talk about this more in detail later, but in general, the peoples around Israel worshiped fertility religions, 
they, they saw a man, they saw a woman, they came together, and through the act of sex, magic happened. A baby was born. And they, began, they believed, these pagans did, that the act of sex had power. Wives would tell their husbands that this power, because this power creates life, if our crops are not growing well enough, you need to go to the temple prostitute, have sex, release some of that magic energy so that our crops will grow better. And there were actually prostitutes, male and female, straight and homosexual, who would offer sex. Some of them would do it for free, but most of them did it and were paid. You have made love for hire. That's what he's talking about on every threshing floor. They would thresh the grain to separate the the wheat that you could actually, the kernels of wheat that you could actually eat from the, the chaff, the worthless part of, uh, of the, um, the wheat plant. And on that threshing floor, praying to the, whatever pagan god it might be in the area, praying that that God would bless their harvest by offering up the sacrifice of sex with a prostitute, a temple prostitute. As we look at the growing filth in our world today, this which was incomprehensible to my parents and my grandparents becomes all the more understandable. It's easy to talk yourself into that. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them. You're offering up religious sacrifice of sex to these pagan gods. So the real God says, I'm going to cut you out. I'm going to stop the wheat. I'm going to stop the, the grapes. They shall not feed them and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. Not only am I not going to feed you from my land, I'm not going to let you live there. This is like a jealous husband telling his promiscuous wife, you will get kicked out of the house. You can't live here. But Ephraim, this is Hebrew poetry. We're going to rhyme two ideas. Remember, Hebrew poetry, you rhyme ideas instead of sounds. Unlike our, which relatively speaking, is sort of a primitive poetry, hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. They rhyme ideas. And it's very, as you read the Old Testament, you will see it everywhere. And the rhyming of two ideas has a benefit of explaining something, not from one point of view, but often two or three. You can better understand the, the the message being conveyed by looking at it at different aspects. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Egypt was the land of their captivity. They were slaves in Egypt. And God is saying, you're going to go back to that slavery, but not in Egypt this time, but in Assyria. You will be owned again. You won't be free. You will be slaves in Assyria where you'll have to eat unclean things because that's what your master gave you. Now, it could have galvanized the spirit of the Jews as what happened to Judah when they were in the Babylonian captivity. They became more Jewish while they were in Babylon. The paganism around them made them isolate themselves and separate themselves from the world. But Ephraim's not going to do that. I, the scripture's not talking about that here, but I'll go ahead and tell you. The northern kingdom called Israel is going to be assimilated. And when they come back, they're not really going to be Jews anymore. 
Verse 4, they shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord. You can't worship temple worship in Assyria. Nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. I mentioned, I think, two weeks ago, when you have a peace offering. Now, there were sin offerings, there were free will offerings, many offerings. But the peace offering, you would burn some of the meat, let it go up and smoke to heaven so God could eat it. And the priest would say, you're now righteous before God. You are now forgiven. You're at peace with God. And so you would sit down and eat the remainder of that meat that you had sacrificed. It's now been cooked. You and your family would sit at the table in the temple, and it was though you were eating with God, and you were at peace with God. And here he's saying your sacrifices shall not be pleasing to him. It doesn't mean you're going to offer up sacrifices because they can't, not in Assyria. It means you're not going to feel that anymore. You're never going to know what it feels like to be at peace with God. It shall be like, like bread of mourners to them. As you lose a loved one and you grieve that, that's the way the bread's going to be when you eat it. I'm not at peace with God. A loved one is dead. My life is dead. My religious life is dead. My heritage is dead. And what's even sadder is that as they're in this grief, they won't know that it's because they left God. You know, the lost suffer because they have a God-shaped and God-sized hole in their heart and they don't know it. If we don't tell them, they can't know. You're going to be grieving and lost. And all who eat that bread will be defiled because it's not kosher. For their bread shall be for their own life. You're not going to eat in sacrifice, in a peace offering. You're not going to eat in a festival where you celebrate the grace of God. Your bread is going to be eaten for survival. As you sit there quietly and eat the meager bread you have with nothing for God because you and God have no relationship anymore. It shall not come into the house of the Lord. You will not have a religious celebration with God anymore. It's a remarkable thing that lost people can go to church and receive the, some of the blessings of church. Some of the joy of being in God's house. And Israel had some of that. Even as they had left God for other gods, they were still able to enjoy his blessings. But not anymore. You will be in a foreign land, living in a foreign way, and you will become foreign. Verse 5, what will you do in the appointed day? What are you going to do on the days of the religious festivals? And Israel had a truckload of them. In the day of the feast of the Lord, what are you going to do when those days come? Verse 6, for indeed they are gone because of destruction. And that word destruction can also mean rot. They're gone because of what you did. They've just disappeared. Egypt shall gather them up. Again, this is the idea of going back into slavery. Memphis shall bury them. Memphis, which is now south of modern-day Cairo, was the burial grounds for the pharaohs. But the pharaoh wasn't the only one who got buried there. He would bring his nobles and his slaves You shall be buried as slaves to a pagan god in a pagan afterlife. Which, of course, is metaphorical because there is no pagan afterlife except hell. Nettles. We're talking about thorns and thistles. Nettles shall possess their valuables of silver. The, the wealth you had 
will just be overgrown. Thorns shall be in their tents. In the tent where you lived, it's going to be overgrown with weeds and thorns. The days of punishment have come. Now, literally in the Hebrew, it's the days of visitation. God says, I'm coming. Much like a, a mother who yells to her children when it's bedtime and they're still playing around in their room. Don't make me come up there. God says, I'm coming. And it's going to be punishment. The days of punishment, the days of visitation have come. It's now time for judgment. In my house, we would count to three. God says, I've counted to three. Now it's time. The days of recompense, the days when you get paid what's coming to you, have come. I have tried, I have pleaded with you, I have done everything I could, sent prophets to you, sent disasters that were intended to draw you back to me, and nothing's worked. It's over. We're divorced. You're no longer my people. It's time for you to pay. Israel knows the prophet is a fool. Now, the word prophet means, it, it literally in the Hebrew, was a bubbler over. Because the idea is he received the word of God and it poured out of him. But the prophets in Israel were fools. Jesus says that if you call someone a fool, you're in, in danger of the fires of hell. And we misunderstand because today the word fool means goofy. And we wonder how can you be in danger of going to hell for accusing someone of being silly or goofy. But the word fool here, remember in Proverbs, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. The word fool here means, yes, a silly person, but it also means evil and twisted. The word fool in your Old Testament means someone who's going to hell. The prophet, the prophets of, it, of Israel were all headed to hell. What prophecies were they preaching then? What teachings were they giving if they were all headed to hell? You know, the we Christians believe that the pastor in our church can be headed to hell. But the word of God that he preaches is under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And people can be saved by listening to the preaching even of a lost man because it's God's word, not the preacher's word. But in this case, the prophets are are all going to hell. And the spiritual man, this is Hebrew poetry, we're still rhyming it, is insane. Literally, what comes out of him are insane rantings. Instead of the word of God bubbling out of him, insanity bubbles out of him. Maybe the closest uh, example we have of that today is the idea in charismatic churches of the Holy of speaking in tongues and the rantings that come out that belong to the Holy Spirit. Imagine if those rantings coming out are insane and evil. The people of Israel don't even have a chance because their prophets, their holy people, are all lost, preaching insanity. And I'm not going to go far with this, but <laughs> you might try turning on the television and hearing some of the preaching that goes on nowadays. Why? Because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. Now, there are two words for sin that we use most of the time in the Bible. There's sin, which means to miss the target. You shoot at the target and miss but there's the word iniquity is the word twistedness, pervertedness, to be crooked. I have sins. 
I commit sins, but my iniquity is my twisted nature, my twisted heart, my twisted mind, which gives me a twisted life. They had prophets who were fools, spiritual men who ranted insanity because they were twisted and evil and great enmity. The second reason they were doomed was they had great hatred for God. They hated God's word. We live in a world today of people who hate anything Christian. And the only Christianity they want to allow is the Christianity they have twisted to agree with them. They declare they're not going to listen to the word of God unless it is itself changed, rewritten, to suit them. And we think that's a modern phenomenon. It was happening here. They had twisted the word of God then to suit the pagan world around them. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God. That's not a good thing. Ephraim has set themselves up to sit beside God. We are watching out for the spiritual interests of the people. Only what they were leading them into was damnation. And they were supervising, making sure that everyone believed the, the insanity, the damned foolishness that they had set up. Today we see a bit of that. The law is trying to tell Christians how to think, how to speak, what to believe. Ephraim has set himself up to sit beside God and tell people what to believe. But the prophet is a, snaller, is a fowler's snare, as a tongue twister, in all his ways. The prophet simply puts out traps, bird traps, to catch you. To throw it, catch you with a net, to catch you with a spike catch you by letting you fall into a hole or to eat the bait and have a box snapped on top of you like a rabbit trap that's what the prophet is everything he preaches from Ephraim from Israel the northern kingdom is intended to ensnare people to trap them enmity in the house of his God hatred in the house of God. He's a, he's a prophet. He works in God's house. But he traps people because he hates God. When you refuse, the Sunday school teacher, to teach the word of God, it's because you hate God. When you refuse, preacher, to preach the word of God, it is an act of hatred against God. And you do it because you hate God. And you want your own religion instead. Verse 9, they are deeply corrupted, rotten, decayed, rancid. He, God, will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. God punishes sin because God loves us. If God did not punish sin but allowed us to thrive in it, we would go to hell happily. But by punishing sin, God forces us to realize there's a better way. We should be grateful when God punishes us. And the more he punishes us, he tells us, like a father does his child, we should see it as proof of his love. God loves me enough to worry about me. He hasn't given up on me yet. You said, well, pastor, you, you told us that he's given up on Israel. Yeah, now they're pagan. But he loves them now the way he loves pagans. And he wants pagans to come to a knowledge of him as well. Verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers 
as the first fruit on a fig tree in its first season. You were so underdeveloped and weak and frail and nothing. The idea there is I took you when you were nothing and I made you. But they went to Baal Peor. When, it's a little bit of a long story, when King Balak wanted to curse the Israelites, he hired the prophet Balaam. And you remember the famous part of the story where Balaam was stopped by an angel riding his, his jackass on the way to the to a vantage point where he could curse Israel, curse all the Israelites. And the animal saw the angel first and rebelled. And Balaam beat him until the angel allowed angel allowed the animal to speak. So Balaam realized that he was forbidden by God to curse Israel. Seven times Balak paid him to curse them. Seven times instead he gave a blessing to them. But because Balaam was being paid, he found out a way. The, the women of Midian were attractive to the men of Israel. And so they invited them to a festival where they were going to worship their God. Now the word Baal, by the way, simply is Semitic and it means the Lord. And there were Baals all over the, the land at that time. So it's not like there was one God, Baal. There was Baal Peor. Peor was, well, the, the word means opening. So we wonder if it means maybe a, a gap in the mountains, like a valley, or we're not quite sure what it means. But it was an area as well. So he was the god of that area. You would have Baals all over who were the gods of their area. The ancient peoples believed that their god was local. And so when you picked up and went to another town, you would quit worshiping your god and you would worship the new god because you were in his town. Well, the women said, why don't you come to our party? Which turned out to be a, 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 a religious worship of their god. And in their fertility religion, as I explained earlier, they worship their god by having sex. And the men of Israel said, that sounds like a good idea. Sex has been used by the devil for all of human existence. To trap God's people into sin. We know that sex is a gift from God and is intended for husband and wife one man and one woman, any other variation of that becomes sin. Inside of marriage, sex is a wonderful and blessed thing. Outside of marriage, it is fornication. If you're married, it's adultery. And it is evil. But not for the first time, the Israelite men said, you know what? We can do both. We can have sex with the beautiful women and we can stay Jewish. We can stay people of God. Well, of course they couldn't. And that always became a problem. The worship in, of the Midianites stayed a, a thorn in the side of Israel always. God saying, I took my people in their 40 years of wandering in the, in the wilderness, I established them as a nation. They owe me everything, and yet they slept with those women. And dedicate, excuse me, and separated themselves to that shame. Now, the word separated is also used for a religious dedication in the idea that a, a, a man separates himself from the world to become a pastor. 
they dedicated themselves to that shame. He doesn't even call it religious worship. He says it's shame. And they separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination, just like the thing they loved. Now, in the Hebrew, that both means they, they became an abomination like it, but it also means they became an abomination to the degree that they loved it. They intensely loved it and therefore intensely became an abomination. An abomination means something disgusting, but so disgusting as to be hellish, to be outside of the kingdom of God. Verse 11, as for Ephraim, remember Ephraim is the largest city in, excuse me, the largest um, tribe in the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes, and therefore they spoke for the entire nation. So when you say Ephraim, you're talking about all of the northern kingdom. But as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. What is their glory? Well, you don't have to worry or wonder very long because God explains it in the second half of verse 11. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. The glory of Israel had been their children. Both the large number and how smart they were, how strong they were. With a love for life comes lovable life. If you love people, you invest in them, you protect them, you love them. But there are some cultures that do not value their own children. They kill them, they abuse them. You say, certainly everyone loves their children. No, some cultures do not. Some can easily waste their lives, strap bombs to them, sexually abuse them. Their children are not their glory. We Christians believe in life because a love of life means a love of and an opening of all the possibilities of that life. Now you may argue, well, what then about capital punishment? Because the people who support abortion call people like me who love life hypocrites for not being against capital punishment. The difference is that capital punishment is only done by the laws of this land and by the laws of the Bible in defense of life. In other words, you don't execute everybody. You execute those who are a threat to life. In our country today, our laws state those are that's defined by people who have killed in such a heinous way that they are a real danger to do it again. We don't execute someone who we believe might be dangerous, but only those who've already already killed in a heinous way. If we ever become a people who are happy with abortion, who are happy with murder, who are satisfied with killing others, if we ever decide we need to get rid of all our senior citizens because they're just a financial drain. If we become the people who hate life, we will lose the glory that God gives in each life. When we consider the babies who have been aborted, how many of them were doctors? How many of them were great leaders, great scientists? How many of them were geniuses? We'll never know. How many of them could have been a blessing? Well, we know that answer, every one of them. Every one of them, those lives aborted, could have become a blessing. And could have made the world a better place. 
but we killed them. That's why murder is so heinous. To snatch away a life is to snatch away potential, glory. And God says, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Verse 12, though they bring up their children, though they do raise children, yet I will bereave them to the last man. When the Assyrians attacked and finally conquered Israel in every city, they told the parents, we're going to march you back to Assyria to be slaves. So we're going to kill everyone too weak or too young to make the trip. You can either bring your children out for us to kill them or we'll come in and kill them and you too. God says, I will bereave them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them, when I'm no longer their God, when I'm no longer their protection, when I'm no longer their Savior, woe to them. We see then that hell is our choice. And the punishments of hell are the result of what we want. It's not God standing up from heaven, throwing lightning bolts down at us. Hell is the home we make. Verse 13, just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre. Now, Tyre was a city out on a rock, out in, out in the Mediterranean. Because of that, it is one of the oldest cities in, in human history. Because the problem with cities was always that it, they would become rich and become targets of thieves. And finally, a group of thieves would come in with their own army and kill everybody and steal everything and destroy the city. But Tyre was exempt for that for thousands of years, maybe 4,000 years. Because they were out on a rock in the sea and they were a great seafaring nation fishermen who became traitors, who became, well, they had their own armies as well. It's an interesting name. They were rich because of fishing, but also because of um, the clams, the mussels that were in the rocks around their city. That when you let them, when you piled them up and let them rot, they would develop a purple dye that was very beautiful and, and very rare, so very expensive. The royal purple color that we are familiar with today is from the, those mussels, those clams. So Tyre became fabulously wealthy and everyone tried to attack them and no one could win until Alexander took the city on the coast Sidon, which was opposite um, Tyre, destroyed it, took all the rocks from the city and from the walls and made a highway through the water. They just kept dumping the rocks in the water until Alexander the Great could roll his war wagons right up to the walls of the city and he destroyed the city killed most of the 30,000 people who lived there, sold the rest into slavery. God says Ephraim was like that. They were set up securely, planted in a pleasant place. So Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. Ephraim was set up in that wonderful place like the city tire. But one day, Israel's going to walk its children out and say, here, kill them so you don't kill us. Take us into slavery. Verse 14, give them, O Lord. What will you give them? Now, that's a rhetorical question. The people pray, give me this, Lord. Give me that. They still prayed to God. 
even though they were lost? What will you give them when they ask you, gimme, gimme, gimme? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. No children, that's a mercy. Every child who's not born is one who's not gonna be murdered by the Assyrians. But it's also a lessening of the glory of Ephraim. All their wickedness, verse 15, is in Gilgal. Gilgal is an interesting place. It's where the covenant was read to the people of Israel when they came into the promised land. It's where Saul set up his, his, his authority, his, his capital. It's where there was a, a powerful school of prophets. But in these later times, the priests there were wicked. Imagine worshiping in the name of God using the, the wording of Judaism, but worshiping pagan gods in God's house. Imagine First Baptist Church Batesburg of Leesville worshiping Satan inside the church. That's what happened to Gilgal. It went from being God's place to Satan's place. Again, all because of sexual immorality. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them because of the evil of their deeds. I will drive them from my house. He doesn't just mean Gilgal here. He means the whole land. I will love them no more. The husband telling his wife, you're no longer my wife. I'm kicking you out of the house. I am taking a stick and beating you out of my house. All their princes are rebellious. Princes means leaders. It doesn't just mean royalty. It means a leader of all types. Whether it's a prince of whether it's a prince of um, industry, a prince of business, a prince of whatever aspect of life. All their leaders are rebellious. Everyone who is somebody in Israel rebels against God. Verse 16, Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. We're, all we're talking about children here. No more children. No more heritage. No more future. Yes, were they to bear children, I would kill the darlings of their womb. Verse 17, my God will cast them away. Not the children, the people, the grown-ups because they did not obey him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. A wanderer doesn't belong. They won't belong in Assyria, but they'll be pagan just like them. No home, no heritage, therefore no future, no children no life. This is what it looks like to abandon God for the trappings of Satan. Israel has wanted this. God gave them the divorce because they broke his covenant and now he's telling them what they're gonna what it's gonna be like. And if you listen carefully, this is grace. Because hopefully some of them, not what history tells us, not nearly enough, but hopefully some of them heard and said, this is horrible. I need to repent. And if you're a Christian in name only, can you hear this? Have I made it horrible enough to you? where you hear it and say, I need to repent or else my children will be lost. My grandchildren will be pagan.
you know it's a funny thing we atheism is pushed in this country today but the more atheistic an area becomes the more pagan as I said earlier we have a God-sized and God-shaped hole in each in each heart in the heart of each one of us and we will fill it with something spiritual and if we don't fill it with the one true God we will fill it with a fake God people today may say they're pagan excuse me may say they're atheist but they will worship pagan gods and they will give their lives over to them it's the way Satan has won against different cultures throughout history and he will continue to wreak havoc until Jesus comes back they shall be wonders among the nations as I said earlier in hell and in divine punishment which because hell is divine punishment sinners get what they asked for if you won't sin you'll get it if you want the life of sin you'll have it if you want apathy you'll have it only by seeking the kingdom of God and its righteousness only by seeking Jesus Christ can you be saved. And no matter who you are, no matter what name you had, you know, the, the people of Israel said, our fathers were men of God. We inherited Jehovah, Yahweh. We inherited the true religion. Not knowing they'd already thrown it away. Like them, we can say, I was raised in church. I know all about church. And yet we can be lost and headed for hell. Are you worshiping the one true God? Or do you worship another God? Stupid phones won't behave. Let's think about that. As we seek revival by asking God to show us where we need to repent. As always, in Christ's service and yours, I am your pastor. Good night.